President Cleveland, Where Are You? by Robert Cormier. That was the autumn of the cowboy cards, Buck Jones and Tom Tyler and Hoot Gibson, and especially Ken Maynard. The cards were available in those five-cent packages of gum, pink sticks, three together, covered with a sweet white powder. You couldn't blow bubbles with that particular gum, but it couldn't have mattered less. The cowboy cards were important. The pictures of those rock-faced men with eyes of blue steel. On those wind-swept, leaf-tumbling afternoons, we gathered after school on the sidewalk in front of Lemire's Drugstore across from St. Jude's Parochial School, and we swapped and bargained and matched for the cards because a Ken Maynard cereal was playing at the Globe every Saturday afternoon. He was the most popular cowboy of all, and one of his cards was worth at least ten of any other kind. Raleigh Tremaine had a treasure of thirty or so, and he guarded them jealously. He'd match you for the other cards, but he risked his Ken Maynards only when the other kids threatened to leave him out of the competition altogether. You could almost hate Raleigh Tremaine. In the first place, he was the only son of August Tremaine who operated the Uptown Dry Goods Store, and he did not live in a tenement, but in a big white birthday cake of a house on Laurel Street. He was too fat to be effective in the football games between the Frenchtown Tigers and the Northside Knights, and he made us constantly aware of the jingle of coins in his pockets. He was able to stroll into Lemire's and casually select a quarter's worth of cowboy cards, while the rest of us watched, aching with envy. Once in a while, I earned a nickel or dime by running errands or washing windows for blind old Mrs. Belander, or by finding pieces of copper, brass, and other valuable metals at the dump and selling them to the junkmen. The coins clutched in my hand. I would race to Lemire's to buy a cowboy card or two, hoping that Ken Maynard would stare boldly out at me as I opened the pack. At one time, before a disastrous matching session with Roger Lussier, my best friend, except where the cards were involved, I owned five Ken Maynards in kinder considered myself a millionaire of sorts. One week, I was particularly lucky. I had spent two afternoons washing floors for Mrs. Belander and received a quarter. Because my father had worked a full week at the shop where a rush order for fancy combs had been received, he allotted my brothers and sisters and me an extra dime along with the usual ten cents for the Saturday afternoon movie. Setting aside the movie fare, I found myself with a bonus of 35 cents, and I then planned to put Raleigh Tremaine to shame the following Monday afternoon. Monday was the best day to buy the cards because the candy man stopped at Lemire's every Monday morning to deliver the new assortments. There was nothing more exciting in the world than a fresh batch of card boxes. I rushed home from school that day and hurriedly changed my clothes, eager to set off for the store. As I burst through the doorway, letting the screen door slam behind me, my brother Armand blocked my way. He was fourteen, three years older than I, and a freshman at Monument High School. He had recently become a stranger to me in many ways, indifferent to such matters as cowboy cards and the French town tigers, and he carried himself with a mysterious dignity that was fractured now, and then when his voice began shooting off in all directions like some kind of vocal fireworks. Wait a minute, Jerry, he said. I want to talk to you. He motioned me out of earshot of my mother, who was busy supervising the usual after-school skirmish in the kitchen. I sighed with impatience in recent months. Armand had become a figure of authority, siding with my father and mother occasionally. As the oldest son, he sometimes took advantage of his age and experience to issue rules and regulations. How much money have you got, he whispered. You in some kind of trouble, I asked, excitement rising in me as I remembered the blackmail plot of a movie at the Globe a month before. He shook his head in annoyance. Look, he said, it's Pa's birthday tomorrow. I think we ought to chip in and buy him something. I reached into my pocket and caressed the coins. Here, I said carefully, pulling out a nickel. If we all give a nickel, we should have enough to buy him something pretty nice. He regarded me with contempt. Rita already gave me 15 cents, and I'm throwing in a quarter. Albert handed over a dime, and all that's left of his birthday money. Is that all you can do? A nickel? Aw, oh, come on, I protested. I haven't got a single Ken Maynard left, and I was going to buy some cards this afternoon. 
Ken Maynard, he snorted. Who's more important, him or your father? His question was unfair because he knew that there was no possible choice. My father had to be the only answer. My father was a huge man who believed in the things of the spirit, although my mother often maintained that the spirits he believed in came in bottles. He had worked at the Monument Comb Shop since the age of 14. His booming laugh or grumble greeted us each night when he returned from the factory. A steady worker, when the shop had enough work, he quickened with gaiety on Friday nights and weekends, a bottle of beer at his elbow, and he was fond of making long speeches about the good things in life. In the middle of the Depression, for instance, he paid cash for a piano, of all things, and insisted that my twin sisters, Yolande and Yvette, take lessons once a week. I took a dime from my pocket and handed it to Armand. Thanks, Jerry, he said. I hate to take your last cent. That's all right, I replied, turning away and consoling myself with the thought that 20 cents was better than nothing at all. When I arrived at Lemire's, I sensed disaster in the air. Roger Lussier was kicking disconsolately at a tin can in the gutter, and Raleigh Tremaine sat sullenly on the steps in front of the store. Save your money, Roger said. He had known about my plans to splurge on the cards. What's the matter, I asked. There's no more cowboy cards, Raleigh Tremaine said. The company's not making any more. They're going to have president cards, Roger said, his face twisting with disgust. He pointed to the store window. Look. A placard in the window announced, Attention, boys. Watch for the new series, Presidents of the United States. Free in each five-cent package of caramel chew. President cards? I asked this maid. I read on, collect a complete set and received an official imitation Major League Baseball glove embossed with Lefty Grove's autograph. Glove or no glove? Who could become excited about presidents of all things? Raleigh Tremaine stared at the sign. Benjamin Harrison, for crying out loud, he said. Why would I want Benjamin Harrison when I've got 22 Ken Maynards? I felt the warmth of guilt creep over me. I jingled the coins in my pocket, but the sound was hollow. No more Ken Maynards to buy. I'm going to buy a Mr. Goodbar, Raleigh Tremaine decided. I was without appetite, indifferent even to a baby Ruth, which was my favorite. I thought of how I had betrayed Armand, and worst of all, my father. I'll see you after supper. I called over my shoulder to Roger as I hurried toward home. I took the shortcut behind the church, although it involved leaping over a tall wooden fence, and I zigzagged recklessly through Mr. Thibodeau's garden, trying to outrace my guilt. I pounded up the steps and into the house, only to learn that Armand had already taken Yolande and Yvette uptown to shop for the birthday present. I pedaled my bike furiously through the streets, ignoring the indignant horns of automobiles as I sliced through the traffic. Finally, I saw Armand and my sisters emerge from the mountain men's shop. My heart sank when I spied the long, slim package that Armand was holding. Did you buy the present yet? I asked, although I knew it was too late. Just now, a blue tie, Armand said. What's the matter? Nothing, I replied, my chest hurting. He looked at me for a long moment. At first, his eyes were hard, but then they softened. He smiled at me almost sadly and touched my arm. I turned away from him because I felt naked and exposed. It's all right, he said gently. Maybe you've learned something. The words were gentle, but they held a curious dignity, the dignity remaining even when his voice suddenly cracked on the last syllable. I wondered what was happening to me because I did not know whether to laugh or cry. 